Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Today in the home studio, we have a wonderful artist in Nick Otero. And welcome, Nick. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're going to have some good times over here. Um, we want to take opportunities like this to introduce people to our clientele, uh, put a name behind some of the work that they're starting to see. Um, Blue Rain, as you know, um, we've been working with Victor Goulet for oh, off and on for about 20 years. And he was pretty much my first introduction to this art form. And it wasn't until recently that uh, Blue Rain really made a, a broader approach to getting into the type of work, your medium. And uh, we're very appreciative and excited to have you on board. It's exciting. It's yeah. exciting to be <clears throat> part of that that um, that introduction. I think it's something that's needed, you know. Yeah, and you know, one of the one of the things I've emphasized is that a lot of our Hispanic artists um, don't go through the gallery systems, right? And um, it's it's time for them to start paying attention. Uh, it, because it helps with notoriety, it helps get the messaging out. Uh, platforms like these, like what Blue Rain has to offer uh, through podcasts or social media platforms or print materials, uh, that's something that, that they're missing out on by not going through the gallery systems. Um, and it, it is important. But before we get into all of that, that business part and all that, mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and how did you get into this art form? Well, I'm Nick Otero. I've, I've been doing this art form now for about 26 years. I started out in high school uh, through a program that was funded by a museum from Santa Fe, and it was about becoming aware of the cultural arts, more specifically the Hispanic arts of New Mexico. And so I started working in this medium at the age of 16, and I worked with uh, various other artists um, to learn different techniques, to learn iconography, things like that. And so over the course of those 26 years, I've kind of refined it into, uh, into my own, you know, kind of developing my own style, uh, learning about the history, learning about uh, the culture, and, and basically my, my culture that I really wasn't aware of until I started to actually participate in the cultural art form, you know. So I've, I've been doing that for 26 years. I'm from Las Lunas, New Mexico. My family's been from that area uh, for quite some time, uh, generationally speaking, we've been from uh, Tome, the Tome area, El Cerro area. Uh, my grandparents are from there. My mom's family is actually from Silver City. And so before I was born, my dad had gone to college at Western New Mexico University. And there he met my mom, and then I came to be. Oh, nice. So in 1981. <laughs> yeah, so I'm 41 years now. Oh, still a baby. I hope so. I'm feeling <laughs> feeling older as time passes by, you know. Tell tell us a little bit about the history of uh, being a santero. About about being painting saints. I'm, this is a tradition that obviously goes back to the colonial times uh, or the Mexican period in New Mexico where this specific art form is indigenous to only New Mexico. Uh, this style you won't find anywhere else in the world. It's one of those styles that, you know, if you come to New Mexico, you learn about the Santos, you know that they have their own appeal. It's almost like a, a folk art, basically. You know, it's developed into this big art form where there's a few people that are doing it now. Um, but like you said, there's, there's a, lot, um, a lot of artists that could be in galleries that maybe should be represented uh, in this traditional art form itself. I mean, other than the annual markets that you have, uh, you probably don't see much of it out there you know, in the art world. And so my goal as an artist is to help promote that tradition, not only for myself, but beyond myself to other generations by being a teacher. You know, I went to school at UNM. I got a degree in education and I was actually teaching elementary school, high school and middle school uh, for the last 13 years. And it wasn't until about two years ago that I actually started to do my work full time. Oh, nice. So that was, you know, that was a, that was kind of like a segue. I kind of took a dive post pandemic to kind of go into the art form and, and really analyze, you know, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Do I want to keep, you know, spreading myself thin and being a teacher during the day an artist at night? Because it was getting, it was taxing. It was taking a lot from me. Mm -hmm. 
So I took the dive two years ago and I decided to just do it full time. And I think about that time is when uh, Blue Rain had asked me to be part of uh, one of their shows that was probably um, assisted by Victor Golette at that time. He was helping you kind of come up with some. I think it artists. was in the it was in the middle of COVID, and Spanish Market had been closed down. Right, and um, I felt like we should reach out to his Hispanic community because he didn't have a voice, and we were one of the only galleries that was theoretically open. Uh, everybody else was so scared. They're like, oh, but our, our building was so big. We're like, well, let's do this anyways. Right. Right. And that's where the invitation came in. And it, and it kind of thrived after that. I mean, after that initial show, it was pretty successful. I think, you know, a lot of people were really pleased to see uh, this art form elevated at that level of, of um, the art world because people, you know, other than the markets, like I said, we're only seeing it maybe once, twice a year, a winter market and a summer market. But the reality is that a lot of us who work in this tradition are producing work throughout the year, whether it's through commissions or, you know, museums, things like that. I've been fortunate enough to be able to do uh, work for churches out in California. I've got one church um, that has a whole set of my stations at the cross. They have major pieces that are, are large scale. And so my hope is, as I continue to grow and become an artist in Blue Rain Gallery is to work on a larger scale. Uh, to be able to do pieces that you know, like you see in the churches that are that are surviving now. So I know you were um, working with um, Victor Goulet in the Las Trampas right. Church. Tell us a little bit about what's going on. Well, I, I've always been a huge fan of Victor Goulet since I came to to know this tradition. So when I was 16, 17 years old, I knew of Victor Goulet as a legendary carver and innovator uh, in the tradition itself. And over time, I developed a friendship with him. But also during that time, I was kind of lobbying him, you know, to learn how to do conservation. It wasn't so much that I wanted to learn how to paint santos and carve santos. What I wanted to do was figure a way of how I could preserve them. And it took years for me to uh, convince him to finally give me a try. And so he had been working on a project here in northern New Mexico at Cordova. And he was restoring him along with uh, Felix Lopez and another community member. They were restoring this uh, church's contents. There was numerous old historic pieces from like the 1830s. And, and I was able to go and visit and see him in the process of that. And so I kind of, again, nudged him like, hey, you know, take me on for your next, your next project. And so he had called me and asked if I wanted to, to work at, up at Trampas. And so that's been an incredible experience in itself because... It has six major altars inside of it. Um, they haven't been cleaned for years. And I think when the pandemic hit, they stopped doing mass there. So there wasn't anything going on in there for at least the last four years. So what we've been doing and what I've been doing is driving from Las Lunas all the way up north twice a week to go and work with them and learn those techniques. And so it's kind of, it's it's interesting because it's, it's a very technical, um, uh, profession in that there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of play with like chemicals to determine, you know, what it takes to clean certain pieces. Um, and, and some of the paints, you know, are volatile. So you have to be very careful with how you're cleaning and preserving. And so that's, that's been a fun journey. It's been something that, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's been rewarding because in a sense you get to be part of that process of preserving something for the next three, 400 years. You know, yeah. well, I'm 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 grateful for that. Um, and you probably know uh, my my grandfather is Bernardo Mira Pacheco, right? It, uh, you know, what seven back or whatever. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely like one of the more legendary uh, santeros, and I think a, a lot of what derived from his work into this the folk tradition. He was a, a main inspiration. He was a, a genesis for the imagery. You know, he was very classically trained. He was an incredible artist, cartographer. You know all about him. But, um, yeah, he's definitely an icon in the saint. Well, it seems like um, Victor was uh, really interested in some of those techniques brought over from Spain that he was, that he kind of introduced as well into this area. Uh, right. That's with the carving, with the gesso and, you know, right. uh, all of that. So um, where did you learn most of your skill set from? A lot of it, um, early on when I was working, believe it or not, uh, Rhonda Crespin, who was a santera in her own right, a saint maker, she began to teach me basically the techniques and methodologies, but it wasn't really until 
I met Alcadio Otero, who is more invested in like the quality of producing your pigments, the grounds, uh, the quality of your wood, all of that, um, that I really learned to really focus on the quality of my materials. And so along the way, I've had a couple of other teachers. You had one that you know was really instrumental in helping me learn iconography, uh, history. And so I've been very blessed over time to be able to meet these people who are who I now consider you know good friends, and actually competitors now too. Because you know one of the things that uh, I've come to learn is that they were willing to help me learn, but once I was on my own, I was on my own. You have to develop your own style. You have to develop your own style, and initially, when you're working as an artist, you you tend to be inspired by other artists from the get go. But the goal for me was to develop a style that was my own. And I think, I think I've done that. I'm still working towards refinement constantly. And I think, you know, working with like the conservation aspect of Santos and, and getting that experience has helped inform like a stronger quality of my work. So, you know, it's, it's become more important. Yeah. Well, I, I think it helps that when you have people around closer, like El Carmo is in this area, right? Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're lucky. You have yeah. A, a good well, resource. What, you know, what's funny is when I first started working with him, I know I was a young kid at the time and he, he's, he's very good at what he does. Um, when I used to take on my initial work, it wasn't up to par and he had no hesitation to tell me, you know what, this doesn't look good. Do it again. Yeah. And I can remember being upset about that. You know? It hurts ego, doesn't it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, because you know, up until you become an adult, people are always saying, you know, you do beautiful work, you know, that's amazing. Do you know, Nick, what, um, um, from doing my own work, um, when you put it out there publicly, you're, you're exposing yourself. Yeah. It's a huge vulnerability. It's, it is, isn't it? You're yeah. Like, well, anytime I'm making something for the gallery in particular, I'm, I'm nervous to deliver it. It's, it's like a nervous <laughs> thing because is it going to be accepted? You know, and then most often times it is, and it's, it's an incredible reward, you know, to know that the time that you've invested the last 26 or so years is up to that point, that's the, that piece is, you know. Well, you're doing good. I, I didn't make the opening uh, at Blue Rain um, this last, was it no, November? Right. And uh, when I, I came back on, on Monday and I saw these red dots all over the place. Yeah, that was incredible. <laughs> that was incredible. And I was worried because, you know, Blue Rain, for the longest time, its reputation has been native art. Mm -hmm. And so there was a little bit of nervousness there to, to, to wonder, well, how is this art form going to be perceived, you know? I think people uh, get confused that way. They 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 try to pigeonhole us, right? Because we started that way. But if you go into Blue Rain now, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty a phenomenal. hardcore gallery. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think it's it's cool because you have people like Preston Singletary who have I've admired and watched, you know, working in different medium with the glass and all that sort of thing. All of that is inspiring to an artist. It's not just about you know, oh, I just love devotional art. Whenever mm -hmm. I go into Blue Rain, every time it feels like you're going into a museum and you're seeing something you haven't seen before. Yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing. But that's why we like you in there too, because you fit right in. Well, I like it. And so, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, and I, I think um, I, I think Victor brought this up about uh, devotional art. It, there's a, a religious aspect to it, of course. Right. But there are saints that represent aspects of life that regardless of your religion, you can relate to. Exactly. Right? So. Well, I think one of the great things about doing this type of work is usually, you know, you'll have clients that are really, they're seeking out a specific image because they have a certain ailment or they want to bless somebody who's, uh, you know, off on a new venture, whether it's a job or a profession, there's basically a saint for every, every type of thing that you could imagine. There's a saint for skiing, a saint exactly. for cooking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know. And the fun thing is you can be innovative in that regard with, with the iconography. Yeah. You know, that's something that I admire about Victor Golette is, he does work that ties into contemporary culture and people I think are able to relate to that in a better. With a very strong traditional process. Right. Yeah, right. That's, he does balance. And it seems like you're getting there. You're picking up on some good things. And right. I'm, I'm glad you uh, acknowledge, you know, when, when we start off as artists, we emulate. Right. But for us to be successful, you have to find your own voice. Yeah. But getting that foundation of uh, procedure and that, how to paint, what, how to crush your, right. uh, make your paint and whatever. That's, that's all in, very important. That takes years. Well, I think, to learn you itself. know, the authenticity of, of the art form and knowing like the background, like you, you know, you're an artist, you know, the history of clay, you know, um, the history of different types of art forms there. You have to be versed and you have to educate yourself 
uh, because that informs where you're going, you know? Otherwise you think you're an original at something you've done when it's been done before, or, you know, you can figure out ways to be innovative if you learn from the past. Yeah, for sure. Well, we brought three pieces here. You brought a new one today too. I did. But let's let's talk about these. Uh, what are we looking at? What has inspired you about this and the way you've approached? And let's start with the new piece that you brought in. Okay, so this this piece here is is the crucifixion piece. And so typically when you think of retablos or panels, uh, paintings of the saints, it's usually on just a simple flat panel. So one of the things that I like to do is kind of innovate in the sense that where you do different design elements or you do different carved elements, uh, things that pop out at you, negative and positive space, playing with those themes in the work is, is what's important. You know, this piece has some small scale painting going on, has a relief of an angel at the bottom. So I, I'm enjoying going into the three dimensional aspect and kind of playing with the 2D and the 3D together mm -hmm. and finding that kind of harmony, you know? Yeah. Um, other pieces like this piece here that I have is, is a triptych. Um, and so it has St. Dominic, it has the Virgin Mary in the middle, Our Lady the Rosary, and then it has St. Francis on the far right. And they're kind of recessed into uh, the like panels. panels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of free float there. Uh, so the triptychs, you know, doing more than the standard singular image is important to me. Uh, being able to pick images that complement each other, whether it's two uh, different saints from two different orders, like the Franciscans and the Dominicans here, or if you do two angels. So balance is important, you know, in the composition and producing the works to me. Yeah. Um, and of course, they're all painted with natural pigments, you know, even the three-dimensional uh, pieces. So let's talk about what is a natural pigment for our audience, because you can say that, but what is right. that? It's well, not like you're going to the store and buying paint. No, exactly. Well, you can you can definitely import your paints. Um, natural pigments refers to the old style of how artists used to create their their paints. You know, when you're going back into even like Renaissance Europe, where you have these natural clay minerals that have to be broken down, uh, they have to be refined and processed. They have to have a binder attached to them so that they actually stick to the surface. And so. In New Mexico, we have our own kind of limited pellet. I mean, a lot of the pigments that are used in the traditional uh, arts, you'll see if you look at historic pieces, there's a very limited common color pellet among them. And, I, and that has a lot to do with accessibility of pigments, you know. And when New Mexico, of course, got the railroad in 1880, yeah. I think that opened up a bigger door for a wider range of pigments. And, and that's what we're learning through conservation is these artists, you know, had access to oil paints at, at a certain point. Uh, at a certain point, it was just all natural. And so of the natural pigments with, with the Santo tradition, it's an important part of doing the tradition with fidelity. You can be innovative and still use the natural pigments and, and do something incredible like that. But I, I enjoy making the natural pigments. I actually produce... Um, so give me an example of making a natural pigment. Is it clay? Is it sand? Is, what, is it dirt? What is it? Right. So basically, natural pigments can fall into different categories. You've got the vegetal, which is like plant-based. And then you've also got the natural um, clay mineral, which you can use. Uh, for example, like indigo. Indigo is a plant, a blue, um, beautiful pigment that's been used for centuries. It's one of the most popular pigments. That's probably one of the most difficult paints to actually break down and refine. Um, but that's the blues, you know, and that, that pigment was pretty prevalent in colonial times. Yeah. And so you'll see that, that quite a bit. Um, they all have different properties. I mean, sometimes when you're making a certain color, it reacts differently with water and binder than other pigments. The, the more clay based pigments are more receptive to like water, yeah. you know, the natural ones that kind of resist. And so they take a while to mold and break down and refine. And, and I'm lucky in that, you know, I'm able to actually also um, produce these pigments, but I also supply other artists with the, the natural paints that I make, you know? A lot of artists don't, don't have the time, I guess, to, to put in that kind of work. And so I've been, been happy to pass along some of these pigments for other artists to use. And, and I really enjoyed it. Sounds like culturally, um, in some respects, similar to the Native American cultures. Right. Because they, they, you know, you think about the indigo dyes and, and the way the Navajos use them under rugs, or you're talking about the clay pigments and talk about the Pueblos right. using that in their, their pottery. And you wonder if there's been a cross influence on some Well, and I think that's what's fascinating now is, you know, they used to always want to separate Native American arts and the Hispanic arts as two separate things. 
And I think a lot of scholars nowadays are actually trying to and have identified in some cases where the cultures have kind of crossed over each other and influenced, you know, whether it's design motifs, whether it's uh, types of pigments, even the clays themselves. I think a lot of that is borrowed from native arts. I mean, how else would you have known where to go? Well, you know, you're, you're talking about um, coexisting 500 plus years right. with native communities along the Rio Grande. And the, and the Navajos and the Apaches and the, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, native influence. And I think if you did your DNA, you, you'd probably find that you have some native blood in you too. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm but pretty I, sure. I did mine. I was shocked. You I have like 20% uh, Native American. I, was oh, yeah? like, I thought I was pure Chicano there for a yeah, while. Yeah, <laughs> you did. Pura rasa. No. Pura rasa. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, very interesting. No, but. I think that's, that's an interesting dialogue too that, you know, that I, I enjoy, you know, and being in Blue Ring Gallery is the fact that you do have all these phenomenal, you know, native artists, and then you also have our tradition. And so how do those two cultures coexist? You know, what are the conflicts historically that have occurred because of, you know, religious devotional imagery? How was that used as a tool for oppression? And things like that, um, I think an artist who works in the tradition needs to be aware of, uh, because it wasn't always just beautiful saints and angels you know yeah. one of the one of the top um potters working today in contemporary native art is russell sanchez yes and uh, have you met him i have not met him but i've seen his work and he was an award winner oh, this yeah. last he, he won award. best of show and for a beautiful uh, pot but he he collects all of this does he? he's our for collector oh that's pretty cool he comes in he he, he goes through our our stuff that's and awesome. um that's for you, Russell. We'll be talking to you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, so tell us about this piece here. So this piece is a traditional carving in the round, uh, three-dimensional Our Lady of Guadalupe. She's probably one of the most uh, well-known images um, surrounded by rays around her. And she's kind of like in this uh, Nicho kind of setting. It's got a three-tiered like step system, so it's kind of reminiscent of like altars and their holiness. So, for for people who aren't Catholic, who who are unfamiliar with the story, what is the story of Guadalupe? So, so Our Lady of Guadalupe, her devotion goes back to Mexico, and so she made an appearance to a native Indian of that region, Juan Diego, who recently became a saint, actually. And so, what they found with her is that over time. In the Mexican culture, there's certain attributes that have come uh, to be placed on her, like the stars, for example. The stars are a celestial, uh, they have celestial meaning. And, and with the Aztecs and, and the natives, they believed heavily in the celestial you know, aspects of, of their religion. And so you'll see kind of like the combination of those, those cultural elements to make what we now know as Our Lady of Guadalupe. There's debate on whether or not she even actually had a crescent moon underneath her or if that's tied to, you know, the religious um, traditions of the Aztecs. And so she's a very popular image because she, she made four appearances to this Juan Diego and she was known as a dark rendition of the Virgin, a representative of those peoples in that region. But she's also known as a patroness of the Americas. So you're thinking, Central America, South America, all of the Latin American countries, she's become a universal symbol for them. And New Mexico especially. I mean, she's extremely popular here. Well, we're not that far from Mexico, so right. we're going to share a border. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it's interesting, the, the cross-cultural, you know, between the, the, the Spanish Catholics and the natives. And, yeah. um, you know, eventually everybody kind of came under the same religious platform, um, even though that... Some of the native communities have kept their traditions through the kivas, right? But uh, there's been a, a cross integration. And it's kind of nice to see and acknowledge sometimes. Well, and, I, and you know that's one of the things that I love to do too is I, I like to collect Native American art. And so recently I've had this obsession with kachina dolls, the old, Hopi old style. Oh, the old ones. Mm -hmm. The old style. And and the thing that I love about those artists is they're using natural pigments. There's parallels that are happening. And they're young, like me, you know, they're like in their 40s and that sort of thing, and they're still carrying on the tradition. So, in a way, it's a huge responsibility because you kind of feel like an ambassador of your culture. Yeah. So there's a lot of responsibility in that, you know. Well, there's a lot to learn from those uh, Hopi carvers, the contemporary ones, because they're, man. <laughs> I know. I, I, <laughs> like Stetson Hanyamto, I mean, I, I just, he freaks me out. Complex. Detail. Yes. Extremely but, complex. Yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful. Um, what upcoming events happening at the Smithsonian that we need to know about? Ah, so recently I was I was contacted by uh, the Smithsonian 
the uh, Folk Life Festival folks want to bring New Mexico devotional art out there for their upcoming festival at the end of June. Oh, nice. And it'll be through the holiday of the 4th of July and into the following week. And so the theme for this year is religion in America. And so in a, in a really cool way, they've decided to focus on New Mexico and its religious traditions. And so what I'll be doing with them is actually working for two weeks up in D.C. demonstrating my craft. Um, they've asked us to produce a large scale mural. And so hopefully we'll get the attention of the um, Smithsonian Latin American uh, Museum. And so there's there's a opportunity there to really showcase the culture in New Mexico. It's been about 30 years since they've even profiled New Mexico as a culture, as a state on the National Mall. So the goal is to represent the culture, share with people, you know, what we do and why we do. Seems like the, the Smithsonian and a lot of the museums are starting to pay a lot more attention uh, to New Mexico. Um, and that's nice to see. And I, I'm, I'm happy to hear about that, actually. That's, that's a good deal. Yeah, I'm very excited. Well, educating people um, is the best thing you can do right. to create that collector base. And, and right. so that's why we do these podcasts as well. You know, you just want to let people know who you are and then talk about what goes into some of this. Right. There's a lot of there's a lot of thought, there's a lot of history. Right. Um, there's a lot of knowledge uh, that goes into that you described and we appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, well it's hugely important, you know. I since the third grade I had wanted to be an, a teacher before I became an artist. And so teaching and passing on that's a huge component of of my work and so um i enjoy teaching kids i enjoy teaching adults i have a lot of adults that contact me um that want to learn the traditions you know they see the value in it so i enjoy doing that aspect of it so the smithsonian opportunity is probably the pinnacle of like well this is going to be fantastic because it's more nationally internationally known as as a um, as an institution, yeah. Well, I know it's. Um, we've we've had a few artists that have been highlighted um, in the Smithsonian, especially specifically Preston Singletary right. last year. Right, <laughs> right. It's a ten thousand square foot exhibit, uh, well deserved. Yeah, and from what I hear, they they also come to you as as the gallery owner, to, mm -hmm. you know, to see what you have, and they're paying attention to what you guys are doing. We, um, as as Blue Rain Gallery, we we work with museums across the country. And we have placed so many of our artists in major collections of museums. Um, and in fact, you can go to some museums and it's like Blue Rain Gallery. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. Blue Rain Gallery East, Blue Rain Gallery Northeast. Yeah, know, it's, it just, I it's think interesting. It's, it's an amazing thing to see. Yeah, after 30 years. <laughs> uh, it's taken, yeah, so it takes time. It doesn't People take think time. it happens, thinks, you know, yeah. it doesn't happen overnight. No, it's, it's, the struggle is real. You just yeah. baby steps in the beginning and then exactly. sometimes you get momentum. And you work. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming in today and uh, sharing with us thank who you me. are and your work. I'd um, like to encourage our audience to subscribe to the Rain Gallery podcast. Uh, you can do that by going to theraingallery.com under the podcast uh, bar, and then uh, which takes you straight up to our YouTube page. Um, and you can you can uh, subscribe to any of the other platforms as well. Um, also, want to encourage people to take art into their day life by going to theraingprintshop.com. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Appreciate it.